Barack Obama won his 2008 election in part due to Americans' fatigue with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Once elected, of course, Obama doubled the number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan to more than 60,000, and he tripled the number of predator drone strikes that we know about, assassinating enemies from Pakistan to Yemen to Libya, even U.S. citizens. Oh, right, Libya. Obama declared war there, too. Well, then, that's not quite accurate. He just went to war with all the, not all the fuss and muss of having, say, a national debate over it or U.N. approval, let alone what is legally required, the approval of the U.S. Congress. Well, who knows? So that's what Democrats used to demand from George W. Bush before he attacked Saddam Hussein. But the rules that apply to Republican presidents aren't the same as the ones that apply to Democrat presidents, at least in the mind of the media party, which absolutely loved the illegal war in Libya. So the U.S. went to war against Muammar Gaddafi and dragged us Canadians along, too. More than 500 Canadian forces were involved, mainly fighter pilots and sailors. Now, you might be asking, why? I mean, what Canadian national interest was served in attacking Libya? Or more accurately, taking sides in the Libyan civil war between Muammar Gaddafi and a ragtag group of rebels, many of whom are affiliated with the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization. I mean, Gaddafi was no liberal. He was an evil man, a dictator, and probably a, a nut, too. But he was actually doing what we wanted him to do. He paid, get this, more than a billion dollars in reparations for Libya's role in blowing up a jet over Lockerbie, Scotland. He paid $10 million to each victim's family. And that didn't bring them back from the dead, but imagine if the Saudi king paid $10 million each to the victims of 9-11 and accepted responsibility. I mean, I think even a Saudi hater like me would have to acknowledge that they were reforming themselves. And even more importantly, Libya gave up its nuclear program voluntarily. We didn't have to go in there and blow it up. Gaddafi was turning away from weapons of mass destruction, just as others were, like Iran were moving towards it. And of course, there was the economy. Libya was selling a million barrels of oil a day to Europe. Now, that's conflict oil, and our Canadian ethical oil is superior, but that was what Europe wanted. Even Canada started doing a little business with Libya. Here's Liberal Prime Minister Paul Martin palling around with Gaddafi in one of his eccentric tents that he liked to use as his political offices. I guess my point is Gaddafi was a bastard, but he was our bastard, and he was reforming his ways bit by bit. But Obama and the Europeans decided to snuff him out and forced us Canadians to go along with them. Now, I'm not sure why. I mean, maybe Obama wanted to look tough. I'm sure for Europe, it truly was a case of blood for oil. They wanted to keep their oil flowing. But I don't get it. It's not like Gaddafi's appoint, uh, opponents were in the Civil War were liberals or Democrats or good guys. They were barbarians. I mean, look what they did when they captured Gaddafi himself. My God, it was surely out of, out of pure savagery, but it was also to shut him up, you know. They killed Gaddafi because he knew just how diabolical his rivals were and had the goods on how anti-American and violent and pro-terrorist they were. Killing Gaddafi meant he couldn't talk about the rebels, say, at a trial. So we were railroaded along with all of this. Now, I'm not sure why. I mean, we Canadians don't buy oil from Libya. They're actually our competitor in that department. Whether Libya was ruled by thug number one or thug number two isn't really a matter of concern for us, at least not enough to risk the lives of Canadian forces. And I think a lot of Americans are thinking the same thing, especially when Libyan rebels affiliated with Al-Qaeda stormed the U.S. consulate in the Libyan city of Benghazi in September, killing the ambassador and three other Americans there. That was horrendously embarrassing to Obama because it showed that Libya was not, in fact, a liberal democracy, but that rather it was now the playground of terrorists. Gaddafi's laws were brutal. But there was order. Now there is neither law nor order, just a kind of chaos in Libya. No wonder Obama and his staff tried to pin the blame on the violence there on some YouTube filmmaker in California. So that's Libya. But Libya is a small country, really just a few cities and a lot of oil. Egypt, on the other hand, is the largest Arab country in the world. Poor as sand, and that's all they have, an economic basket case, a perpetual dictatorship, and corruption to boot. Bastards, but at least they were our bastards like Gaddafi was becoming. Hosni Mubarak, the long-standing dictator in Egypt, nominally supported America in the Cold War. And more importantly, he abided by the peace treaty signed between Egypt and Israel in the 1970s. It was a cold peace, but it was peace. And Mubarak helped keep at bay extremist Islamic terrorists until he too was toppled. I remember the last year's so-called Arab Spring. Remember that? Oh, the jubilation 
in the liberal media that Mubarak would be thrown off by people power. Not just that, but the people power, including people using Twitter and Facebook and iPads, just like we do, with women and students. How liberal? Yeah, well, like many revolutions, including the Russian Revolution, the liberals, the academics, the gentle people, the women, are quickly sidelined by those who use knives and guns and bombs. And so Mubarak was replaced. Oh, yeah, he was replaced. But by a new dictator, just as brutal, but now with an Islamic edge. Mohammed Morsi is the new tyrant there. His party, the Muslim Brotherhood, is a worldwide pro-terrorist organization. They were the party, for example, that assassinated the former Egyptian president, Anwar Sadat, the one who signed the peace treaty with Israel. Their affiliate in Gaza is called Hamas, a terrorist group that is criminally banned in Canada, the U.S., and much of Europe. And besides introducing a Sharia law constitution, Morsi unilaterally announced that he was seizing vast powers, trumping courts and legislators. He's, he's the new pharaoh. And yet Barack Obama still sends Egypt foreign aid, billions of dollars. Of course he does, because Morsi is Obama's creation. Obama was silent while the mobs were wobbling Hosni Mubarak's throne. For decades, Mubarak had been an ally of the West, a dictatorial, brutal ally, but an ally nonetheless. But Obama was silent when Mubarak needed help. Fine, fine. So Morsi is Obama's handiwork. That's a devastating setback for Egyptians and for anyone who wants freedom or even the equality of women in the Middle East. But it's worse because it signaled to every dictator in the Middle East that America's friendship now means nothing when the chips are down. And if there is a rival force, the Muslim Brotherhood, maybe Iran, those rivals are likely more reliable and more confident and more committed than America. I mean, it used to be said about America, no better friend, no worse enemy. This, that's just not true in foreign affairs anymore, at least in the Middle East. Which brings us to news out of Syria. As we've shown you for a year now, mainly through the video footage of our Arabic-speaking friend Jonathan Halevi on the Arab Underground. Remember that segment every week? Well, Syria's dictator Bashar Assad is in the same position that Gaddafi and Mubarak were just months ago. Assad is being wobbled, attacked, undermined, rebelled against. But just like in Libya and Egypt, he's not being undermined by liberals. Oh, there might be a few liberals against Assad, but mainly it's Al-Qaeda and other equally illiberal, fascist, theocratic, Sharia law terrorist groups. There is no George Washington or John A. MacDonald waiting to take over in Syria, just more Islamic fundamentalists. So far, the West has stayed out of Syria, partly because Syria's protector, Vladimir Putin of Russia, barked loudly enough at the United Nations and elsewhere, partly because Syria is being armed by Iran and even has Iranian special forces come in and kill the rebels. But things are rough there for Assad, and news comes, maybe true, maybe not, that Assad is loading chemical weapons into bombs. And that prompted Barack Obama to speak out. Look at this. I want to make it absolutely clear to Assad and those under his command, the world is watching. The use of chemical weapons is and would be totally unacceptable. And if you make the tragic mistake of using these weapons, there will be consequences, and you will be held accountable. He called it a red line. But what exactly is the red line? I, I don't get it. Is butchering tens of thousands of civilians using regular bombs and bullets somehow less, un, less acceptable or less red line-y than killing them with chemical weapons? And what's America really going to do about it? Put American soldiers on the ground in Syria? Now, probably not. Obama will do what he likes to do best. Lots of predator drone strikes, lots of missiles lobbed in, maybe some jets pounding things from the air. Okay, showing off. But to what end? Who exactly does Obama want to be the new leader of Syria? Which terrorist group? And will he go in and root out Iran's troops on the ground and maybe Russian advisors? Who's going to fill the void? Will we have a new U.S. embassy in Damascus that will surely be attacked and overrun like the one in Benghazi, Libya was? I mean, this is called foreign policy. Obama has none other than some speeches. He's not a leader. He's not an executive. He's a campaigner, a soundbiter. He thinks lobbing a few missiles is foreign policy. He's a disaster. There is no U.S. interest in getting involved in the Syrian civil war. Civil war. There are no good guys. Keeping Iran out is a good idea, but Obama doesn't have the stomach or the know-how for that, he doesn't have any plan. But here's my point. If there is no U.S. national interest in Syria, well, the same must go for us Canadians times 10. 
Obama's a foreign policy disaster. Libya, Egypt, Iran. Freedom is in retreat around the world. It's a shame. But Obama is America's decision. We have to make our Canadian decisions. There is no possible Canadian angle in Syria. No possible Canadian interest. No possible Canadian role. No possible pro-Canadian outcome. Let these savages kill each other. Let Obama flail around. The Arab Spring is a failure. It's a Muslim Brotherhood coup. The best thing for us is to stay away and to protect our people here at home.